Good morning. Good morning. Anybody else having fits with allergies this past week? Yes. Woo, they've been rough. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Circleville Christian. Um, we have a good morning uh, uh, for you guys this morning of worshiping our Lord. Ryan Hayden is back in house today in this month. And Brad, did we have that thing queued up? I, I kind of forgot to talk to you about that now. Okay. We'll get that for you next week. It's a fun little uh, thing that Brad came up with for Ryan to encourage people to be here during the month of August. Um, a few announcements this morning. Uh, we're going to start off with the family movie night. Uh, the movie has been selected. Can you get a drum roll, please, Ian? Toy Story 4 will be shown here on August 14th, next Sunday at 6 p.m. Come enjoy popcorn, candy, pop, and door prizes. Kathy does a great job of engaging with everybody, and you got to remember what's going on throughout the movie in order to get a door prize, right? For the most part? Okay. Are you nonverbal this morning? Okay. All right. I love Kathy Dyer, if you guys couldn't tell. Um, Biker Sunday is also coming up. That's on August 21st. Um, that is, uh, it was funny, I called Mike McLean yesterday thinking Sturgis had already happened. And so I called him and uh, I said, hey, I'm sure you're really tired right now. He's like, I am. And I said, how was the week of Sturgis? And he said, well, today's day one. And I was like, oh, okay. So um, that's on the 21st. We're going to have a presentation from Mike. Um, he's going to bring all of his biker buddies um, as well. It'll be a great Sunday of worship, uh, fellowship. Um, and uh, and a, just a great overall Sunday. They're going to talk about what they saw up there, who they ministered to, and just how everything uh, went up there this year. Um, and what do I got next? Talent show uh, on August 28th uh, with Gary Bell. There's going to be food at 4.30, talent beginning at 5.30. Come enjoy fun that evening. Uh, contact Gary if you want to be a part of the entertainment. Kathy, you want to sing a solo on talent night? She says no. Okay, so if you want to sing or but play she'll some, sign one. She'll what? She'll sign one. She'll sign. Oh, you, you do sign language? I didn't yeah. know that. All right, so Kathy's going to be doing sign language on, on talent show night. <laughs> Ooh. On, so on that day, we're going to have Sundays on Sundays. So we're talking like hot fudge Sundays. All the, okay, so ice cream. For the simple-minded folk like me, ice cream Sundays on that Sunday. Perfect. Cool. Uh, the next one, I'm going to have Judy Olson come up here real quick and Lori Thomas because I feel like I have not been doing a good enough job announcing and giving information about this. So uh, come over here, ladies, please. Okay. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Well, the first, we have a couple giveaways. We're working on Kathy Kimmy's uh, book signing that we're going to do here in September, and we want to give a, a couple books away. I'll be okay. Your, I'll be your Vanna White. Okay. Oh, Vanna White. Okay. Well, just to, just to show your age, we were talking about fanny packs, <laughs> and they've come back around, and Jake didn't know that when they first came out, you wore them on the back side, not on the front side. So, we and he came up with this idea. What lady has a coin purse in your purse. Not a wallet, but a coin purse. Do you carry those? Does anybody carry those? Look, Leo, do you have one? Do you? Can we see it real quick? Okay, that's all right. Here you go. Here, you get a book. Okay, you do it. All right. <laughs> I knew that was going to be an issue if they have to dig. Okay. Oh, there's another one back there. Well, I only have one for the, I only have one for that giveaway. Oh, okay. okay, and then the next one, whoever sprints up here the fastest, <laughs> wins a book. Yes, give Larry a big hand. Norma has you trained very well. <laughs> so those are the two we're doing this morning. Okay, well, there's going to be some more over the next few weeks. So. If be you're prepared. So be prepared, yeah. Because yeah. we wanted to say, this is Christy Kimmy, and those of you who remember, she was Christy Cochran when um, I grew up with her. She was in Vonda's, and Max is our class. And um, all ever since I've known her, she's always wanted to write a book. So what her book is about is her process of going through that and her struggle and um, not 
um, using your fear of, of the unknown to, um, to stop you. And so she says that um, get energized by God's power, overcome fear, and live the extraordinary life that he has designed for you. It's a good book. It's a nice short read, but we want to encourage you to come on this Saturday, um, September 10th, um, the women, and join us. Bring your friends. We want it to be a huge thing. She's going to do a talk for us. Tell us about her process, and we're going to have the praise team, and we're just going to have a real good, fun um, morning worshiping God. All right. Thank you, ladies. So that's coming up in September. Um, other things that are happening coming up in September um, as well is uh, kids uh, kicking off on the 7th, I believe, uh, for Kids Club. Um, and then Merge Midweek, is that also on the 7th, Angie? I don't know. Okay, all right, to be determined. Okay. Um, and uh, we've got uh, the, uh, in September as well, Don and Tammy's house. Uh, we're doing the Fall Fest Fellowship Fishing uh, everything out there at Don and Tammy's. Okay, am I m missing anything that somebody needed to, to let other people know about? Okay. Uh, I forgot to do this last week, so I figured we're just going to start in August. Um, I, I promised a few months ago that we're going to make note. Does anybody remember, because this was my favorite thing as a kid when we were at the old building, when it was your birthday or your anniversary, what you, anybody, anybody tell me what you got to do? Bring, bring, bring money up and put it in the little mini church, right? Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So I don't have a mini church uh, or anything like that, but I want to just, uh, if we can as a congregation, I know Jeannie Arnold, your birthday was last Sunday, and I wish I would have started then because you were here, we could have sang to you, but I would like to just sing for August birthdays. Can we do that, praise team? We can do that. Okay, if everybody in the congregation would sing along too, I'll let Doc kick it off. Happy birthday to you. Everybody, happy birthday to you. All right, and we've got anniversaries. Max Leertz was uh, this past week. Um, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Max Leertz, Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Paul Duvall, and Mr. and Mrs. David Allen. Okay, so happy anniversary to all you guys. Yeah. All right, with that, let's get church started. Y'all could stand for me, please. We'll pray, and, and then we'll start singing some, some worship to our Lord. Father God, we're so thankful that we can have fun. God, we're so thankful that we can be free um, in, in, in where we worship, Lord, where we're at, uh, whether it's in a building, whether it's at home, out of park, it doesn't matter, God. It's all because your son came here to give us a chance at life. God, we just thank you so much for Ryan being here this morning. God, whatever the message he brings to us, Lord, help us have open hearts, open minds to just soak in what he's got for us this morning, God, because you anointed that word to come to us through him. God, we just thank you so much for, for some precipitation that we've gotten. God, we ask for some more rain, Lord. We ask for, for you to just put your hand upon us, God. Keep us, hold us, and Father, just help us worship freely with you this morning, God. We love you, and we thank you so much for sending your son. It's in his name. Amen. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, raise your banner high. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heaven shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. Not to us. Before your throne, the only place for those who know it's not for us, it's all for you. Send your holy fire on the suffering, let our worship burn for the world to see. It's not for us, it's all for It's all for you. No 
sun is raging, it's all for you. The universe is spinning and singing, it's all for you. Your children dancing, 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 it's all for you. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Take a few minutes to say hi to one another this morning. To your name be the glory, not to us, but to your name be the glory, not to us, but to your name be the glory, not to us, but to your name. Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. But all an empty world could sell is empty dreams. I got lost in the light when it was up to me. To make a name the world remembers But Jesus is the only name to remember And I, I don't want to leave a legacy I don't care if they remember me Only
Holy second point to him. Holy Jesus. Oh. 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 Jesus is the only name. Jesus is the only name. only name to remember I I don't want to leave a legacy I don't care if they remember me only Jesus and I I've only got one life to live how about every second point to live only Jesus Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. La, 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 la. Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I seek, the only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling. Yours is the name, the name that saved me, mercy and grace and the power that forgave me, and your love is all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory, with the saints I will tell my story, there will be one name. glory with the saints i will tell my story there will be one name that i proclaim yours will be the only name that matters to me the only one whose favor i seek the only name that matters to me and yours is the name name that saved me mercy and grace and the power that forgave me and your love is all i've ever needed when i wake up in the land of glory with the saints i will take
tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim And I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story This morning, my med meditation, I've titled it, It Is Finished. And this communion meditation comes from Max Licato with some changes that I've made and some additions. But the scripture comes from John 1930. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There are three words in this verse that we've all heard many times. Those three words are, it is finished. Those three words, it is finished, shattering, and victorious at the same time. I guess that you would say those words were wonderful and in some ways horrible at the same time. It was horrible what Christ went through, but the results are wonderful for you and me. Stop and listen for a moment. Let the words wind through your heart. Imagine the cry from the cross. The sky is dark. The other two victims are moaning. Jeering mouths of the crowd are silent. Perhaps there's thunder. At the same time, the priests in the temple are sacrificing a lamb, and the sky grows dark, and the temple veil is torn in two from top to bottom. The ground shook. Back at the cross, there's weeping. Perhaps, perhaps there is silence. Then Jesus draws in a deep breath, pushes his feet down on the Roman cross, and cries, it is finished. What was finished? The history-long plan of man being redeemed was finished. The message of God to man was finished. The task of selecting and training ambassadors was finished. The job was finished. The song had been sung. The blood had been poured, the sacrifice had been made. The sting of death had been removed. It was over. 
a cry of defeat? Hardly. His hands had not been fastened down, I dare say. His hands had not been fastened down. I dare say that a triumphant fist would have punched the dark sky. No, this is no cry of despair. It's a cry of completion, a cry of relief, a roar of fulfillment, a shout of victory. Can you hear it? A hoarse voice calling, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's over. An angel sighs. A star wipes away a tear. Take him home. Take this prince to his king. Take this son to his father. Take this pilgrim to his home. He deserves a rest. Come, 10,000 angels. Come and take this wounded troubadour to the cradle of his father's arms. Farewell, manger's infant. Bless you, holy ambassador. Come home. Death slayer, rest well. Sweet soldier, the battle is over. We are here this morning to remember what Christ has done for us. We've heard many descriptive words that conjure up word pictures that dis describe just exactly what, what Christ had done on the cross, what he accomplished as he died for us. Those words, prince, son, pilgrim, ambassador, mangers, infant, death slayer, and many more. That's what we think about this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for uh, your plan, which included Christ going to the cross. I thank you for that. I thank you for these emblems this morning, which remind us of that. And I just pray your blessing on this time as we partake together. And I pray a blessing on all of it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
So now it comes to a time when everybody can uh, do a small part in, in furthering the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning that we can be here. Thank you for the opportunities that we have this morning. I pray for and thank you for all those people that give their time and their talents and uh, their financial giving. And I just pray a blessing on that. And this morning I want to Pray for those who are online watching and for those who can't be here and, and for those that are going through the really tough times, uh, time of loneliness, of losses, of health problems. And I just pray, Lord, that your, your hand would be upon them and a hand of comfort. And I, again, I pl pray this morning that you'll bless what is given here and multiply it to further your kingdom. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed this before. Guys, go ahead. Um, some people are different. <laughs> and, you know, there's the kind of different where you go, oh, they're different. And then there's the kind where you go, ooh, they're different. And, and since we live in this place where we have a lot of differences, it kind of matters to us as church how we treat people who are different. So Larry's going to help me here. We're, we're going to do a little, little quick comparison. Larry, stand up here with me if you would, please. So, Larry, how tall are you? Five foot eight. So we got that in common. <laughs> um, uh, how many miles have you ridden on a motorcycle? Oh, a few thousand. A few thousand? 300 yards. <laughs> so we have that in common. What percentage of the time did those rides end with an accident? None. A hundred percent. Well, a hundred percent for me. All right. Well, I got a hundred percent. Hundred percent failure rate. Um, did you play a little league baseball? Yes. Were you any good? No. Neither was I. Okay, so we have something really in common. I was the worst three little leaguers in history. How about you? I was fourth. You were the fourth? Okay, so who's better than me? Um, how about, uh, let's see, uh, where were you born? Plainville, Kansas. Plainville, Kansas. I was born in Converse, Indiana, so we got that in common. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, uh, have you ever hit? Have you ever played around golf and, and scored below 100? <laughs> Ask Mr. Patton. I can't answer that question. Because <laughs> I haven't. Me okay. So see, we got a couple things in common. Where did we meet? Right here at the church. Do we ever laugh with each other? Most of the time. We ever laugh at each other? All the time. All right. <laughs> so if I'm understanding right, we've got a lot of things that aren't very much in common. By the way, how old are you? 76. I'm 52, so we got that in common. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that aren't exactly the same. That's right. Except for Jesus. That's right. There's what we have in common. Thank you. Give him a, give him a round of applause. So we do live in a place where sometimes our differences are accentuated. And uh, uh, sometimes there are people we disagree with. Sometimes there are people who like things we don't like, and, and they may not even like us. So what do we do if we live in a place where our differences sometimes are a little louder than our similarities? I think we have some interesting instructions. So James, Jesus' little brother, I believe he wrote his little letter because he was trying to tell the church 
we've lost something in translation. Time has passed. Jesus is raised and gone to heaven. And, and James is trying to say, look, I watched my brother live and die and live again. And I want to make sure you don't miss this in translation. And so in the second chapter of James, where I, I pick up from, from uh, last month when I was here, I want to look through the first 13 verses of that chapter and just talk about what do we do when someone's not like me? Or when someone doesn't like me? And I'm not even sure I like them. Because we're still the church. And so there needs to be a biblical worldview with an eye on Jesus on how we live in a world like this. Look at the first four verses, if you would. James says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you, you sit there, sit here on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? What's so evil about favoritism? Are you allowed to have favorites? Are you allowed to like some people more than somebody else? Because we do, right? But what do we do when we do? And there's our issue. You know, some people like caviar, some people like pork rinds. I think they're both wrong. <laughs> the answer is Cincinnati-style chili. Anyway, that's... How many, has anyone ever had that? A couple of us. Is that not heaven? I know, there's quite a divide in opinion on that anyway. Um, you know, we all have these things we do and don't like, and people we do and don't like, so what do we do when we do and don't like? And maybe some of that do and don't like is, is a little bit about each other. He says, okay, favoritism, what's the problem? Here's the problem. Um, the best grocery store in the world is Aldi's. Because everything is cheap. Buy a banana, two cents. Buy 10 gallons of milk, 14 cents. I love Aldi's. There's all the, I, mean, just, I love the pricing. So, but here's the thing. We live in a world where everything's got a value and everyone thinks different things have different value. But I want you to think about what it would be like if we were the groceries. If we're on the shelf and God has priced everything and he's running around the store and people are saying, what's the price on this? What's the price on that? And God's scanner is out and he scans, you, you know what the price is? And he scans you the price is his son. You know, when he scans me, what the price is his son. You know, when he scans at the end of the aisle, the people that we don't like and he scans them, you know what the price is? His son. So here's the problem when we start thinking that someone has more or less value in our world around them. They already have a value assigned by God. Can you imagine <clears throat> running a grocery store and coming in some morning and someone came in and rearranged all the shelves and rearranged all the prices? You would be how happy? <clears throat> Every time we decide someone is more valuable than somebody else, we're rearranging God's prices. And he's already said, here's the price. And so if we're going to have a biblical worldview with an eye on Jesus, one, we have to understand everybody's got a value and it's the same value. The value is the cost of Jesus' blood. And that's it. No variation. <clears throat> Past that. We also have a place. The description here says, well, someone's got more or less value and it's going to be where you sit and you're going to have a good spot and I'm going to have a bad spot and all this kind of thing. We already have a place assigned to us. Again, biblical worldview, I'm going to argue, is unique in our world because it sets things in order. And we already have a place assigned to us. And you gather up enough. We can say, what is our place in the universe? Hebrews 2.7 says we were, made, we were made a little lower than the angels. That's a place. It also says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 3, that we will judge the angels. So we're lower than the angels, but there's something about us that means we will be offering some kind of judgment. I recognize the word angel is going to include both God's angels and Satan's angels. And so then we have uh, Revelation 3.21. Actually, Genesis points out that we're to have dominion over the animals. So animals are somehow under us. Angels are over us, but we have an opinion on them. And then in Hebrews 2, 7, it says... Or in, Revelation 3.21, Jesus says, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. We have a place assigned to us. Our spot in the universe is already described by God in His Word. 
So when I start moving those pieces around, this person belongs here, this person belongs there, I'm overruling God's placement. How smart is that? We have a value and a place. Everyone else does too. And if we're going to stand in God's word, we need to recognize the people around us who may not be like us, who may not like the things we like, vote the way we vote, think the way we think, laugh at the things we laugh at, play golf the way we golf. They still have the same place and the same value. In a time where people are incredibly divided, this is different. I can entirely disagree with somebody. It doesn't mean it changes their value and how I have to treat them. And it doesn't mean that it changes their place and the spot that I put them. Important things from Jesus' little brother. And so it really comes down to, am I going to play God or am I going to let God play God? If I'm going to let God play God, then we as the church recognize the value in the people around us that's assigned by God and the place that's assigned by God, even if they don't recognize it. Verses 5 through 7 say this, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom of God? He promised to those who love Him. But you've insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of Him to whom you belong? So here's the question. Do I have to be poor in order to be good? Because this could be a little confusing here, right? Because you just read, said, well, all the, all the poor people are good and all the, the rich people are bad. Ah, uh, no. Recognize that in the first century, as James is writing this, and persecution is broken out, persecution is coming strictly from the Roman Empire. And the Romans are the only people who are wealthy in James' neighborhood. He's not saying poor is good, rich is bad. He's saying, wait, wait, has God chosen anyone poor to be rich in faith? By the way, anyone grow up poor? Can you be poor and have faith? Anyone grow up not poor? Can you be not poor and have faith? Absolutely. He's, what he's, he's describing here. Is, he's just saying, look, God's chosen the poor people to have faith. It's not that it's in juxtaposition against the rich in having faith. He's saying, look, recognize the Roman Empire. They're the ones wiping you out. You got a whole lot of you, which we're going to be poor people. Rich in faith. Recognize this whole thing is not about repositioning who's better than who. It's not one thing over another. God has chosen, and we live here, and what are we going to choose back? Faith or not faith? It's kind of that simple. And he's saying don't ignore the fact that just because you're poor doesn't mean there's no faith. Just because you're rich doesn't mean there's no faith. Just recognize life is hard. And get some of the order right here. And he ends with this. So the Roman Empire, at the time uh, of James' life, as he's progressing through his leadership in the church, you've got persecution going on. You've got a number of, of emperors who now have declared themselves God, and there's what's called emperor worship going on. And then there were other people who wanted that and, and tried to position to get some of that, and everyone wants to be God. Do we live in a world where everyone wants to be God? Some things never change an interesting perspective to wrestle that down but he says look these these who are the wealthy they're the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong so here's the thing about slander slander has to be wrong and it has to be intentional usually malignant is part of the contention as well right so what happens if you slander a name long enough in front of certain people does it change their perspective if you talk bad enough about someone long enough is it going to besmirch that person's name? Pretty good odds. What is, in our culture today, could, could we come up with a top five or ten names of those who are being slandered currently? We can do that pretty easily. And we wouldn't even have to leave Washington, would we? <laughs> but here's my thought. Even during an election period, there are some names that get slandered more often than your favorite or least favorite person to complain about. 
even if it's not the, the, the right season of sport where you have the, the enemy uh, rivalry going on and you, you want to slander that group. You know, I, I think there's a pretty consistent, there's not a, 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 an election season or a sports season or a hunting season or anything like that that goes on. We don't see the same name slandered more than any other. Know what I'm saying? How far can you get before somebody is wasting God's name? James had a concern about that. He just touches on it. Rome was doing that. Rome was, try Rome was trying to make God's name worthless by wiping out those who believed in God and chasing them and moving them and trying to get them out of the way. Do we have a problem with anyone trying to waste the name of God in our world today? Just stuff to think about. James says, hey church, here are issues. No everyone has a value, no everyone has a place. And no God's place where his name belongs. And don't waste it. He moves on. And he, in verses 8 through 11, he says this, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing what is right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, and you're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For the one who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not murder, but you do com if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you're a lawbreaker. And reiterate, he went back and he said, and by the way, if you play favorites, you're breaking the law. Guilt. Sits heavy in this. But it's not the guilt that doesn't have reward. Because he starts with this idea of the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who has the capacity to love their neighbor? Can you think of anyone who doesn't? So it's a universal command for all of us to become aware of as far as how we live our lives. But think about this. We're all to love our neighbor as ourself. Anyone ever not love your neighbor as yourself? So I got this friend. We're going to call him Joe because he's a real nice common name. Um, and, and Joe and I are talking just a couple weeks ago, and, and, uh, and he says, building this new house it's kind of my it's my last house and and it's it's what we're going to need for the next 30 years and um and so i'm meeting my neighbors on both sides they're not like us and i said joe here's the issues you're the only one like you because <laughs> this guy we call joe is really 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 unique um you know, when I, when I said uh, um, some of us are different from each other, so he's got the one neighbor on the one side, and he starts describing, and I know Joe, and, and, um, and, and going, okay, so the neighbor on one side is different, way different than him. And he just starts describing the neighbor on the other side, and that neighbor is way different-er. <laughs> he's surrounded. He's like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I said, Joe, what's your job? Why? I take care of people. Okay. Joe, who's your Lord? Well, well Jesus. Joe, who do you got to love? My neighbor. Even if they're different and different er. Yeah. So I know Joe and he's he's different. Maybe even like Larry and me. And he's still got the same job. He's still got the same Lord. He's still part of the same church. And so the challenge, the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, and if we fail that we break the whole law. We got a problem. If we break the law, it's got to be fixed. So here's the, the thing that's so wonderful about this whole idea. Remember, heaven's about perfection. No sin in heaven. Get into heaven, you've got to have no sin. So, 
I got to deal with, I'm a lawbreaker, and I got to get that solved. Now, we all know the equation on that. We've sung about it. We've talked about it. Every, every, every time we meet in church, it's the Jesus story, right? He's the only name to remember. There's a reason we sing things like that. From the old hymns to the newest ideas, we all come back to Jesus. And it's it, to, to take that and place that into this space of a lawbreaker because it's the difference between how we react to our world. The need for Jesus. It can be purely emotional. I know, and he, he loved me all the way to forgiveness. It can be purely logical. You can say, well, no, I, I, I failed. I can't have failure and be where I want to be in heaven forever, so I've got to have this conclusion. Maybe we live in the space of mixture of emotion and logic. But to get from point A to point B, we've got a decision to make. And it ends with the last two verses I want to cover today, verses 12 and 13. His challenge from James. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. These two words, mercy and judgment, sit opposite each other, kind of. They're actually parallel concepts. Because mercy as a concept means there's something that has been wronged, someone who has been wronged, and there's something that's been wrong. And I've got to respond to it. Judgment is the same thing, by the way, right? Because where there is a judgment, there is something that has been ruled that there was somebody who was wrong, something that was wrong, and something that was wrong. But mercy is an approach that says all of this wrong gets dealt with by newness. And judgment says it gets dealt with as it is in its oldness. Anyone, um, yeah, anyone ever get stuck in an elevator? Am I the only one who's ever been stuck in an elevator? You've been stuck in an elevator? It was a little, little weird experience. Um, so I, I was young, and my getting stuck in the elevator was my fault. Yours probably wasn't. <laughs> Mine was because there's that red button that says alarm. And I was like six, and I wanted to hear the alarm. I did, and it shut the elevator down, and it stopped there. And it started back up in a minute or so, so not a big deal. But it left me with this curiosity. You know, here's the thing. Bruce Willis always climbed out the shaft, the little, little escape panel, right? Anyone ever look for one? Oh, come on. Somebody else has to be like me. You know how many times I've been in an elevator, I'm looking at the ceiling, and they got the little drop panel, I'm lifting the panel, sliding to the side. I'm looking. I don't know how Bruce Willis climbed out all those elevators. Because there's got to be a way out. Here's the thing, because nobody wants to be trapped in an elevator. Anyone have a fear of that? I mean, how long were you stuck? Okay, that's not too terribly painful. Was it bad enough? You want to go back there? Want to do it again? Want to be stuck there for longer? Nobody likes being stuck. Here's the thing that was between mercy and judgment. We get to decide what elevator people are in. The people around us as church, we get to decide, is there a way out or not? By the way, every Bruce Willis movie where he climbed out an elevator, there's at least 93 of them, would not have been as good if he never got out. Why? Because escape beats being trapped. Because mercy beats judgment. I really hope that as we go about being church, as we interact with our world, because the, the, the final word here was that no mercy if you're not merciful. Boy, that should sit heavy on us. That should tell us the main, one of the main themes of how we interact with our world is we should be more merciful than anybody else out there that anyone ever meets. That doesn't mean lack of accountability, but it means we offer newness, a way out, not just being stuck. Can you imagine how horrible it would be if the world's perspective on the church was, oh, they're the people who just judge us and we're, we're stuck where we are. we live in a world where that's the rumor because if that's the rumor about us we got a problem now it could be some of our own making it could be all the lies about the church because you know no one wants to tell the truth about God's people but nonetheless my hope is for you me and Larry and all the rest of the church 
that people come to us and find a way out, not a way to be trapped. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Oh, I hope we're way, way better at mercy than judgment. Because if we're not, then James is right, and there's been something lost in translation with the church. Something he was very concerned about. To make sure we know what wins. Who believes God wins? If God wins, and we just read that mercy triumphs under, over, over judgment, God's going to exercise what first? Mercy. Mercy is what wins. God wins, therefore if we want to win, we will look like Him. and We will exercise mercy everywhere we possibly can. And judgment isn't our job anyway. I think James was really on to a very modern message. He was concerned that somewhere in the intervening years, the church might have gotten a little bit lost in deciding how things were supposed to be. And it strikes me that if we're going to go be the church, we will value everyone with the value that God placed on them. The life of His Son. We won't just do that. We will know the place everyone is supposed to be. It's a little below the angels, it's above the animals, but the goal is to be next to Jesus. So we'll know the value and the place of everyone around us. We're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, because that's the law. And we're going to love our way into our life with Jesus rather than run around just trying to hurt people. And we're going to know our imperfection. I have failed the royal law amongst a whole lot of others. And therefore, it's very hard for me to be judgmental if I have to, the need for mercy myself. My goodness, what a great church if we win with mercy. We show people the way out, day in and day out. Let them know what they're worth. Let them know their place. And let them know their destiny. Then James will have taught us a great lesson. And maybe the world listens one person at a time. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would send us with our own uniquenesses and all of our differences and our being different and different to her and all the different things that make us who we are. I pray that you would use us as you have made us and as we have built into the lives that we have lived, that we will be people of mercy. Lord, take us with all of our individuality and all of our color and all of our lack of color and all of our life and our lack of experience and everything in between and help us be your body, those who are called out of the world to call people out of the world to find who they really can be and who they really are. Lord, help us not lose what James was worried, worried about us having lost, but to listen to those who are there. Thank you for his life that he got to watch Jesus live and die and live again. And I pray that we, the church, would be the hands and feet of the one who lives again. Lord, I pray that you would take this church today and send out every individual as we are to love, to fulfill the royal law, and to give people their worth in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. stand and sing the closing song with us. The cross behind me, the world behind, no turning back, raise your banner high, it's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky, let the people clap their hands and cry, it's not for us, it's all for you. Not to us, but to your name, be the glory. Not to us, but to your 